Welcome to Shanghai, the commercial capital of China and perhaps even Asia. I'm Tim Harcourt, the airport economist, and I'm standing here on the terrace of the iconic M on the Bund. I'm going to show you how to do business in the world's most populous country and what you can do to get in on the action. China is an economic superpower and a truly massive place, but don't worry, I'll take you inside the Great Wall and give you a tour of one of the economic wonders of the 21st century. We'll get insights from local business people and learn from foreigners who've cracked the market and tapped the Chinese consumer. But first, let's take a look at what you need to know about China. China is located smack bang in the middle of Asia. It's the world's third largest country, bordering the Pacific Ocean and 14 other countries, from Russia to India and Vietnam. The political capital is Beijing, but Shanghai is where the main stock market is located and where business gets done. China has more people than any other country on the planet, teeming with 1.3 billion citizens. It became the world's second largest economy in 2010, after growing at three times the global pace since Deng Xiaoping opened up the economic system in 1978. China is the 76th largest economy on a per capita basis. But given it's got over 1 billion people, that's a pretty impressive effort. Chinese economic expansion has slowed from rapid double-digit growth a few years ago to a more sustainable 6.5% a year. China's undertaking a huge transition from a nation of shippers to a nation of shoppers. From export-led development to domestic consumption and investment, there's a growing middle class who demand designer goods, healthcare, and even an international education. Demographics are also changing. Rapid urbanisation has created a string of massive second and third tier cities of 10 million plus people, like Qingdao, Jinan, Chengdu, Chongqing, and Wuhan. And they're all creating business opportunities as well. These cities need infrastructure like airports, roads and railway stations for the fast trains that propel people and goods across the countryside. So we've established that China is a big deal. ANZ Bank served at Australian businesses and found Greater China is the most popular region to do business in Asia. I spoke to the bank's Greater China CEO to find out why. Today, when you look at the global business, China impact is almost everywhere. Is it easy now to break into China, are there significant barriers of entry when you, <coughs> when you do business in China? Well, I think in general, the Chinese economy is uh, in the transition. Um, we are going to move from export investment led economy to more domestic consumption economy. It could take maybe 15, 20 years to complete the transformation. But I would say the global industries of global companies are looking at this trend. And they, if they can position them well, you have a huge opportunity in this country. Historically, Shanghai has played a very important role in driving growth. Do you think for foreign companies now, Shanghai is the first step to enter the Chinese market still? I think a lot of foreign companies go to Hong Kong first, then go to China but China is opening up for quite a long time. There are a lot of uh, multinational companies are using Shanghai as uh, a spring board, then going to the hinterland of China. And, and what role do you see the Shanghai free trade zone play? How relevant is this to the new economy in China? My personal view is uh, Chinese government used the free trade zone as an experiment to introduce a lot of new rules and regulations which is more and more in line with international practice. If it's successful, they will move it out of the zone and become a general practice in China. So that actually is part of the economic reform. It's not just for a sort of a free trade zone. The ANZ Opportunity Asia report shows that Australian businesses in Asia are far more profitable and have better growth prospects than their domestically focused peers. Can your business really afford not to consider the opportunities that Asia presents? Read the ANZ Opportunity Asia on the sbhub.com.au. Telstra is one of Asia Pacific's biggest telecommunications companies, and it's been operating in China for over 25 years. Its Greater China CEO says local partners are essential to success in the mainland market. The local company can help you to understand the consumer, understand the buying behavior, and also that bring you to the much bigger customer base, and also that tap into the local ecosystem, including the innovation and the supply uh, relationship. 
that you might need for your business. What are your top tips for managing a relationship with a local partner in China? Sure. I think building the relation trust is the most important, so that you need to start with small and trying to uh, don't set up too ambitious uh, plan, and so that you can build that trust through time. So it, it takes a long time to build a trust in your business relationship, but it's worthwhile because that uh, you want to make a commitment and have to stay here for long term. And so, and also that you know, trying to be able to contribute value in your partnership, set the right expectation, so that you can you know have a win-win partnership to differentiate your solution service, expand your business in China. You've done a lot of research about companies forming partnerships uh, across different regions and industries and countries. Can you tell us a bit about the research findings? So we conducted that research last year for to survey more than one southern company. So we found out that you know the strategic partnership with Digital Edge is very unique, and we find company feel that you know to serve those you know um, the always on the mobile first customers, especially the middle class you know emerging you know consumers. Uh, it's very important to build that digital partnership with all those you know uh, partners to allow you to be able to expand your capability to be able to serve those emerging needs, uh, particularly in the uh, internet space and in the e-commerce and other social media areas. Uh, so it, it's very important. So companies feel that it's essential for their successful to have digital partnership, and also that they feel that uh, it will change their business model, and also eventually, uh, in 12 months, it will contribute to more than 10% of their business. So it's very significant to help them to expand their capability and access to the new idea, first time to market, and also first you know, innovation. China's economic leaps and bounds dominate the world's financial headlines as a new world order emerges. But China's not exactly the new kid on the block. The Middle Kingdom is one of the world's oldest civilizations and dominated global trade for centuries, along the Silk Road and ancient shipping lanes. Up until the 17th century, China dominated the global economy, and the Chinese were great traders and innovators, with paper, gunpowder and tea all developed in China. Shanghai itself has always been an international city. As you walk around modern Shanghai today, you see the foreign neighbourhoods, like the French concession area, and in the Roaring Twenties, most foreign countries had embassies here. The thriving cosmopolitan business scene in Shanghai also included a successful Jewish community, with one famous member being Fildale Sassoon, the original owner of the famous Peace Hotel right behind me, right here on the Bund. World War II and the Cultural Revolution threw the country into disarray and depressed the economy. In the late 70s, Deng Xiaoping took over as China's unofficial leader and began an open-door policy. His reforms transformed China into a market economy, reignited foreign trade and sparked the growth that's got China on track to become the world's largest economy. Deng also negotiated the handover terms of Hong Kong and Macau and came up with the one country, two systems approach we see in those two cities. Under Deng's reforms, Shanghai took centre stage as one of China's key economic zones and grew the mega metropolis it is today. Opportunities in China are endless, but how can your business actually capitalise on them? It takes time to navigate the mammoth Chinese market and if not done right, it can cost you way more than you bargained for. Let's find out where to start. Your country's local chamber of commerce should be top of your list. I visited long-time China resident Kenneth Jarrett, president of the American Chamber of Commerce, Shanghai. But I would encourage a company that's thinking of coming to China to make us or any national chamber one of their first stops because you have, within our membership, people who have been here for many years and they have a wealth of experience and they're quite open about sharing that experience with people who are new to market. And we can also help connect uh, companies if they need legal advice or other advisory services. And we have within our membership uh, companies who are willing to provide that support. But it would be, I think, a very a wise and prudent and even essential first step. What are a couple of the sort of biggest mistakes that foreigners would make when they enter the Chinese market for business? Uh, so I would say one common mistake is uh, one day a company wakes up and they decide, well, we must be in China, and then they rush, mm -hmm. and they don't do adequate due diligence. Mm -hmm. and so I would urge companies, as they think about China, to make sure that they understand who they're doing business with, you know, to conduct proper due diligence, and not to somehow feel so impatient, so, so eager that they were going to sort of drop their guard. Corporate advisory company Grant Thornton can help you establish and manage operations in China. I sat down with Kevin Chan to ask whether it's better for a foreign company to go it alone or find a local partner. If a company is really confident about their product offering and they really think that their product or their service could appeal to the Chinese uh, mass market, 
best thing to do, I would say, I would say is still to go alone. However, in certain sectors, it's more appropriate if you have a partner, you know, helping you to explore uh, different channels, different um, resources among the market, such as customer channels, suppliers, you know, uh, and, and talents, back office support, that kind of thing. So with a partner's uh, help and contribution, you may be able, one may be able to achieve its objective much faster, much quicker, much more effective. But finding the right partner is the biggest challenge in that case. And if you do go down that road, what's the ideal setup? Is it a joint venture or a woofie? When a non-Chinese company entering into China, they could set up an entity which is 100% owned by their parent in the overseas jurisdiction. And that subsidiary is called a woofie because it's 100% uh, it's owned and the capital injection is from overseas in foreign currency. Uh, in China, we call that a woofie because it stands for W F. OE, Holy Foreign Owned Enterprise. And you mentioned earlier about what's that difference between a Wufi and a joint venture. A Wufi can be part of a joint venture with a Chinese partner. GM, GM coming into China, they have their Wufi. But that Wufi could partner with uh, a, another Chinese car manufacturer and form a joint venture together. Okay, in, in fact, GM has many joint ventures in China. And what taxes and tariffs do foreign companies have to pay when they set up in China? Uh, in China, uh, all companies have to pay corporation income tax. Uh, when we are dealing with trading and sales and sales of services and goods and products, we've just had a national reform of our tax system. So we are uh, progressing on to using VAT, value added tax, instead of the old business tax you know, in the past days. After the break, we will look at how you set up Get your product around and conquer the Chinese market. We will learn about the power of online selling from local business gurus and get tips on how to do it and set up your own Timor store. China is constantly evolving. As the middle class grows and a sophisticated consumer culture develops, new sectors and opportunities emerge. If you're selling to consumers in Asia, you have to be in e-commerce. Here in China, online shop Tmall has 300 million registered users. It's making it easier than ever before for foreign companies to sell their products directly to the mainland. I spoke to Alibaba's Ken Ma and Blackmore's Peter Osman to find out how it's done. Peter, what's the advantage of selling online into China as opposed to traditional ways of selling? Well, Tim, I think for us, online's obviously a really major part of our business here. About 80% of our sales in China are online. And I think for, for foreign companies, it's a, it's, a, it's a relatively easy route to market. Um, obviously, Blackmores, we have, our own, uh, we have our own companies in China, a wholly owned subsidiary in Beijing and, and in uh, branch offices in Shanghai, the Shanghai Free Trade Zone. And we have quite extensive physical distribution, but online is still the biggest part of our business here. And obviously, we do have a very strong partnership with, uh, with Tmall here in China. And, and Ken, how successful are foreign sellers here in China? Yeah, I think there's one number I want to share is uh, till 2014, the Chinese people buying online market is over 21 billion US dollar. And we expect to grow to over 245 billion by uh, 2020. And Timor Global, there are over 5,000 international brands working with us very successfully. So the good example I would take is Black Moss. So Black okay. Moss is became one of the top health supplements brand in Timor and Timor Global. Peter, do foreign businesses still need a bricks and mortar approach to selling in China or is, or is it online? Is that the way of the future? Look, Tim, I think I think it really depends on your on your product and and the consumer de demographic that you're you're aiming for. I mean, for us, as I say, for Blackmores, we do have both a physical presence and we have an online presence. And I think, but I think for particularly for Australian companies and smaller companies that are entering the market, I think an online presence is a very easy route to market and one which you know obviously Timor has great has a great platform and a great skill in helping companies to to sell online uh, online in China. And who are the big domestic? online shoppers, Ken, what regions, what demographic? What we can say is it's showing more potentials in the uh, rural areas as well. Because for the tier, first tier city like Shanghai, Beijing and Guangzhou, of, of course it's easy to buy both of online and offline. But I would say um, you know, rural areas are more important recently. 
What sort of industries have had the greatest success selling online in, in your business's experience? I think the top industry on Timor Global is including uh, baby and mother products, um, healthy supplements of course, beauty products and also food and beverage. Peter, how important is social media in, in selling products in, in China? What's worked for you? We have a very strong social media presence and a very so strong social media penetration and it's really integral to our um, <coughs> to the way we market here. And a, a good example of that I think is WeChat. I mean obviously WeChat is extensive in China. There's over 700 million users and it's very active. I think that digital communication piece is very major for any company doing business in China. Go to our website for the extended interview and hear how your business can set up its own Tmall shop. Businesses from Singapore to Seoul and as far flung as Sao Paulo and Santiago are hugging the panda and trying to score a piece of the Chinese action. And it's not as hard as you may think. Yes, China is massive in terms of size and population, but it's surprisingly easy to get your product around. Let's find out how to do it. Exporting to a massive market like China might seem daunting at first, but there are ways to make it easier. Talk to government agencies like Austrade about the market and join foreign chambers of commerce to learn from businesses already operating in China. Research relevant taxes, customs duties and regulations to make sure tariffs won't price you out of the market. Advisory firms like Grant Thornton can help you with this. They also have a great background check service performed by their China office. Use technology to get your product to the Chinese consumer without a big investment. China is on track to become the world's top import market for online goods by 2018. I asked Australia Post how businesses can get their product there. Our recommendation is you start on Tmall, really test the market on the marketplace, and then start to think about how you grow your strategy beyond there. And how can Australian businesses actually get their products into China? Is it difficult? No, it's very really simple nowadays. Um, if you st especially if you're starting on a marketplace, you can start to use postal solutions and don't have to move out of your warehouse in New South Wales, ship directly into China, um, straight into the consumer using our network um, and in conjunction China Post Network. And then you can start to move into commercial freight solutions. So as you grow, you start to move beyond postal solutions into commercial solutions for freight. Corinda Organics is an organic skincare company using special Australian bush ingredients. Australia Post has helped it grow and start selling to the Chinese market. In China, there's a very big demand for the uh, cosmetic and personal care products uh, because the Chinese people see Australia as a very clean and green country um, and that our products are very high quality. We utilise the um, Australia Post Tmall platform, uh, which has been fantastic because it's been able to um, remove a lot of the, the challenges for us that would normally be there if we were doing that totally on our own, uh, including the shipping aspect of it. So actually getting the goods physically from Australia over to China. Go to our website for the full Corinda Organic story and find out how your business can start exporting to China. You don't have to be in big business to make money here. In fact, more SMEs have lost money in the USA than China. You dramatically increase your chance of success if you take the time to understand the local culture and how to work with local business partners. I visited the spectacular Grant Hyatt Shanghai for a lesson in corporate dining and entertaining in China. How important is dining and food in business culture in Shanghai? It's extremely important um, because it's all about the relationship, about getting people together, about showing respect, about giving face to the people that you're doing business with. And um, one of the most important ways of showing that is to, is to provide you know, a beautiful meal um, in surroundings such as this. So what are some of the dining guidelines for business entertainment in China? When you come into a restaurant, um, it's important to establish um, where the host is sitting, where you sit relative to the host, um, look for visual signs of where you're supposed to sit, so keep eye contact. Um, better to let them, you know, the person you're entertaining or, or, or the most senior person sit before you. Um, when, when food is being ordered, it's um, extremely important to, to order a lot of food um, because it's very, in, it, it's, it's considered um, respectful. Such valuable advice. I asked Richard for his practical tips on operating and getting around during your Chinese visit. When you come to China, we have a firewall here. So first and foremost, make sure you get VPN um, so you can get access to Facebook, Google, Instagram and so forth. 
Um, this is a very big and busy city to, to get around Shanghai. Um, I would highly recommend um, an Uber account. If you take taxis, make sure you have plenty of cash and don't forget to have the directions clearly written in Chinese. And entertaining, where do you eat out in Shanghai? Shanghai is blessed with a multitude of dining options. We have Michelin star chefs, we have great local street food. It's all here in Shanghai. Um, the Bund area is um, amazing, um, especially in the evening when the lights are on. There's fantastic restaurants and bars there, great nightlife, um, so that definitely would be my recommendation. Go to our website for Richard's full rundown on Shanghai. So is China just about the big end of town? Not at all. Rapid urbanisation in second and third tier cities and an explosion in e-commerce is opening up opportunities for businesses of all shapes and sizes. South Australian skincare company Jeunesse has been exporting to Asia for 20 years and recently moved into the Chinese market. I visited the Adelaide-based company to find out how they did it. There are a few methods of selling into China at the moment, um, but the model we chose to work with was working through a distributor, and that person um, is the... It validates the relationship because if they're actually recognised by the Chinese government, they actually have more validity in their business model. Do you have an online presence as well in China? Uh, in a small way, um, I understand. There is more of a focus to go through bricks and mortar stores because we're working with a product which is high touch. The customer really needs to engage with it, smell, touch, feel. And so that is actually where we focused our effort in gaining our market share in China. A lot of exporters find China challenging. Mm -hmm. You must have had challenges. How have you overcome oh, them? Oh, unbelievable, unbelievable. Um, I think one thing to remember with the China um, experience is that the Chinese government can change their mind overnight. You can't assume that the um, business principles by which you work within your own country apply to any other country that you work with. It's an assumption you just can't hang your hat on. So you have to work with um, understanding that you need to give yourself insurance against sudden changes within um, the laws in China. So there you have it. You don't have to be a big player like Walmart or Apple to make it in China. Almost 6,000 small businesses export here just from Australia alone. So what are the tips we learnt about doing business in China? Don't assume 1.3 billion consumers will do it for you. China is a competitive place and niche is the new black. Get good legal and accounting advice about joint ventures and woofies. Use the government badge and the chambers of commerce. Embassy connections are respected in China and the chambers also play an important role. Try the second tier cities like Qingdao, Xi'an, Chengdu. It's not all about Shanghai and Beijing. Do learn a bit of Chinese history and culture. It will impress your hosts even if you can't speak Mandarin. China is a massive market, but when you break it down by city, region and industry, it is manageable, especially with the right advice and help on the ground. It doesn't matter what size your business, there are riches to be made right here in China. So play your cards right, and like me, you'll be saying thanks China in years to come.